whenever it was reported that foreigners, big big uh, debt holders of uh, American debt, were dumping debt, the tenure would actually rally. So, you know, there's a reason why these things happen, and uh, in my, at least in my view, there's there's no other answer to the question other than the debt is being monetized. Hello there, my friends. Chris Marcus here with you for the Miles Franklin channel on Monday, September 24th. And I'm quite excited to have a first time guest on the channel, someone I've been following and learning from for the past couple of years, who's doing some incredible research and helping people understand what's going on inside the gold and silver markets, since we often don't really get a clear picture of that from the mainstream media. So it's a real pleasure to have Rob Kirby on today. Uh, to talk about the markets, give us your insight of what's going on. So it's a pleasure to have you, Rob. How are you today, my friend? I'm okay, and uh, pleasure to make the acquaintance. Yeah, so let's dig in. And certainly, we have elections in the U.S. coming up. Fortunately, Rob, you're up in Canada, so you get a little bit of a buffer from the madness that's going on here. But with elections, trade wars, petro yuans, about everything else indicating that something is coming. I've wondered if there's something planned before the election. Um, where do you see things standing? Are we nearing a break point? And what's your perspective on, at least as of September 24th, where we go from here? Boy, um, do I think we're close to a break point, I guess was uh, uh, the nub of your question. Uh, I suspect we could be. Um, I, I believe that the state of the global financial system is in very dire straits right now. Mm -hmm. And I think that the system basically is being held together with the equivalent of bungee cords and paper clips, uh, you know, which, which uh, people of a certain age would 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 know that uh, the reference of a, a, a MacGyver, we call this a MacGyver tactic, where we use all you know commonly found household items to uh, hold together uh, very complex uh, structures or things that otherwise would would have long broken down. But I think the financial system has been MacGyvered to a point where I'm sure MacGyver's even shaking his head. <laughs> yeah, that, it would have made for quite an episode if we had MacGyver try and figure out what's really going on with the US dollar. I mean, especially because as I sit here and watch what's happening where you see President Trump escalating a trade war with the largest creditor to the United States, you look at 21 trillion in debt, we can dig into perhaps a little later, the missing 21 trillion. Um, and I find it interesting how Trump having bankruptcy experience makes me wonder if there's something being planned that we're not told because they're already told the budget projections, they're not talking about cutting, they're already when we're gonna hit 30 trillion. So it would seem almost when you hear people talk about a reset that at some level, whether that's currently being planned or not is inevitable, but do you think that that is ultimately the path we're going to be headed down in one form or another? I mean, it kind of seems like how else does this end? Well, let's just put it this way. Um, in the last year, and, and, and uh, as a backdrop to this, to this comment, uh, you made the statement uh, that, uh, about America's traditional financiers who haven't been buying American debt in recent years, the last couple of years in particular. Uh, let's, why don't we just talk about this one? Let's talk about how total American indebtedness that's admitted, uh, the American debt in the last year has grown by 1.4 trillion. Um, and the people who historically have done all the buying haven't bought any. Mm -hmm. And let's just say that if you take the 
10-year U.S. government bond as a marker, the yield on the 10-year in the last year has now gone up by 76 basis points, roughly from 230 something to 3.1. Mm-hmm. And so a 75% increase in, ba- sorry, a 75 basis point increase, which amounts to about, uh, it's more than a 25% uh, move in yield. And and what that means is that $1.4 trillion worth of debt is worth 25% less today than it was a year ago, which means somebody has taken a haircut to the tune of, or, or, or a group of people have taken a haircut in terms of what those bonds are worth today versus what they were worth a year ago, someone's taken a $450 billion haircut. And don't you think we should be seeing something, someone bleeding from the ears if they've taken a loss like that? But the reality is nobody's nobody's showing any signs of pain at all. Uh, The economy seems like it's Goldilocks. And the mainstream media tells us that U.S. government finances are getting better. So my question is, who bought those bonds and why aren't they bleeding from the ears, whoever it is? And of course, uh, I'm going to answer my own question with my own answer. The reason we, we don't see anyone bleeding is because the U.S. government, via the Exchange Stabilization Fund, is monetizing their own debt. And and people who want to know, well, Rob, where is the Exchange Stabilization Fund getting all this money? Well, they're getting all this money because they created at least $21 trillion worth of funny money off book, and that money is siloed in the Exchange Stabilization Fund. And it was done so with the express purpose that when foreigners uh, started to get coy with what America was doing, in in terms of its stewardship uh, of the world's reserve currency, the dollar, uh, they could could summon this money uh, to effectively uh, buy the debt that foreigners were dumping. And I mean, this is why, if you wanna go back two years ago and three years ago, when, when, when Russia and China were lightening up a lot then, but the 10 year yield stubbornly didn't go up, And in fact, there was a period of time for at least a year, a year and a half, when whenever it was reported that foreigners, big big, uh, debt holders of uh, American debt were dumping debt, the tenure would actually rally. So, you know, there's a reason why these things happen. And uh, at least in my view, there's, there's no other answer to the question other than the debt is being monetized. Yeah, which uh, I know, as we, and we talked a little bit before as we, we started recording the interview today, how anyone who questions any of this is, you know, looked at as a conspiracy theorist. Although, if anyone in the mainstream can explain, I've been baffled as well, where we saw Russia sell the majority of their treasuries for whatever reason, we don't find out till months later. But then looking back, you see that really that was occurring at the same time the treasury, the 10 year was rallying again, when the fed is supposedly unwinding their balance sheet. Um, Again, maybe it hasn't been as substantial as Russia, but I've seen data indicating that China, Japan, and uh, Germany in recent months have been reducing their holdings. Maybe again, not a lot, but certainly they're not taking on more debt according to the data. So, it does seem baffling and <laughs> who's buying it and i've come to the to pretty much that view that you have where you know, was the exchange stabilization fund or some of these pools of money that are not being discussed publicly in one way or another um well i think chris what we you need to pay attention to the nuance 
uh, it was announced with great fanfare back, what was it, three or four years ago, when, when the Fed uh, announced with great fanfare that they were discontinuing their QE program. Well, everyone believed that if the Fed had announced and said they weren't uh, involved in QE, that that was the end of basically, call it America, or American-centric institutions buying American debt. Yeah. Well, the, re the reality is the Fed stopped their QE, but I, I, would, I would imagine that's when the ESF uh, ramped up their own QE. Yeah. So hmm. it's, it's not so much whether QE's happening or not, or whether one party is engaged in QE. Uh, the, the, the real question is, who is engaged in the QE? And, you know, it's, it's, it's been the work uh, it's been the work of uh, recently, like within the past year, of uh, research economist Dr. Mark Skidmore mm -hmm. and uh, Catherine Austin Fitz, ex uh, uh, Undersecretary of Housing and Urban Development. Uh, um, you know, they've they've pointed out that the money has gone through the books of two government agencies, Department of Defense and HUD, uh, and there's 21 trillion at least. Uh, that's gone through their books over the period of about 1998 to 2015. And, you know, they discovered this using the government's own numbers. Yep. And when they first reported their numbers uh, publicly, the reaction of the uh, Department of Defense was to basically disable all the links and make the information disappear from public <laughs> view. Okay, so, so and, and it was about a week after Skidmore appeared on Greg Hunter's USA Watchdog that it was about a week after that, in December of 2017, that the White House ordered a complete audit uh, of the Department of Defense, something which has never occurred in, in the history uh, of the Department of Defense. And what we learned uh, from Catherine Fitz in just the past week that what the, uh, uh, what the U.S. government has now done uh, regarding the audit of the Department of Defense is that they've uh, uh, said that if, if there's to be a transparent audit, uh, top secret and classified uh, means and methods would necessarily uh, have to be revealed, therefore, the whole audit is now deemed to be classified and basically nobody's allowed to know what's going on or what the results. So effectively what they've done, Chris, is they've said that the U.S. government is no longer uh, subject to accounting, period. Yep. So they can do whatever they want. And if, and if we question any, anything that they do, or any of their numbers, or any, or any of their spending, they just say, "Well, we don't need to comply or answer your questions because that's classified." So basically, it means the U.S. government no longer has any accounting. It's canceled. Accounting yeah. in America for the government is now canceled. So, in which case, we might as well turn off the debt counter because it doesn't count. It's, it's incredible and maybe it's been that way in the US for a while now they're just finally publicly acknowledging it. Although again, it's not a surprise when you see foreign creditors by the day making arrangements saying we're, we're done with it. We don't wanna do it anymore and be held to this dollar and it's not really a surprise the way these things are going. And again, I grew up in America, lived most of my life here. So I love America and the things that go on here. It's just not proud of these institutions that I think have gone astray. Um, and speaking of that 21 trillion, I actually did email Mark Skidmore when I first heard that stunning report. And again, for anyone who's hearing this for the first time, I'd point out that it wasn't like Skidmore set out to say, I think the government's doing some shady stuff. He actually set out to disprove it because he heard 
these numbers and was thinking, wait, this is, this is impossible. You couldn't claim to lose this much in undocumented adjustments, which, you know, my understanding is if you have a multi-million dollar company, you're doing your books and it's off by five bucks at the end of the month rather than spend, you know, another 10 hours. So 21 trillion being a massive amount. And what I asked him and even Skidmore, who's a PhD uh, economics professor, and I believe is an accountant as well. But how does that, do you have any idea how that relates? If we're told that the monetary base is, I guess, around three and a half trillion, uh, somewhere in the three and a half to four trillion range, and there's 21 trillion that's gone missing, do you have any thought on how you account for that or what that says about what the actual mon monetary base or supply well, let would me, be? Let me explain uh, my, what my understanding is. It, what, it, what it really means is that the data that's reported to us by the U.S. Federal Reserve mm -hmm. and the monetary aggregate data within the Fed Reserve system is tabulated by the Fed St. Louis. Yep. And what it really means is that the aggr monetary aggregate data they report is about as meaningful as U.S. government budget data, which, which is not subject to accounting. Mm -hmm. So what it really means that anything that the Fed tells us is completely 100% erroneous and a lie. But that should come as no uh, surprise to anybody, uh, particularly if they follow the work of uh, uh, the esteemed economist uh, John Williams at shadowstats.com, mm -hmm. who reverse engineers all of the hanky-panky in, in official government uh, data releases, and he, and he shows us that the uh, uh, inflation data, the unemployment data that's reported by the, uh, uh, the U.S. government and the Fed is absolutely fallacious. Yep. It's it's absolutely false, and it's misleading, and it and it's done to uh, it's done to paint a false picture uh, of the state of the economy in the United States. And uh, it's and it's actually you know I mean it's 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 an active crime scene, uh, you know, any any and all U.S. government reporting when it comes to financial or economic uh, issues is is false, uh, misleading, and as far as I'm concerned, quite criminal. But you know the reason this continues is because the deep state or the globalists have control of the, uh, or have a stranglehold on all of the choke points in the US government. They have control of uh, academia. They have control of the mainstream financial press. And, uh, uh, but, their, but their stewardship and, and, their, and, and the lies that they've been telling have become so very, very large and because there has been uh, 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 some real investigative journalism and research is being done in the alternative press and with, with, a, with a viable and uh, free internet, um, this information has been making it to more and more ears and eyes. And this is why the deep state, which nowadays is mostly... Uh, uh, recognizable through the through the uh, ridiculous antics of the uh, of the left or the or the or the Democratic Party in your country, along with a bunch of Rhino Republicans, who now seem to be openly running around with their hair on fire, that that their that their false narrative um, and their and their hubris is being uncovered and being put on display for all to see in its glory. Uh, this, is, this is why these people uh, are behaving so completely and utterly irrational. And uh, it's really quite a sight to behold. Um, and when you, 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 you made the comment uh, about the antics going on in your country, and with me being up here in Canada, um, uh, I might be somewhat, uh, not aware of what's going on. Um, I'm very aware of what's going on in your country. 
And uh, sadly, I have to report that most of the Canadian press seemed to be either in bed with or being potty trained by the likes of CNN and yeah. CNBC because they don't seem to be able to practice any investigative journalism in my country any more than the mainstream press in your country does. And it seems to me that the mainstream news in Canada, which I frankly believe is more or less rudderless and leaderless in my country as well. So um, we seem to be getting reheats of, uh, uh, you know, of the more popularized uh, mainstream, lamestream press in your country. So it's it's not like we're we're immune to the uh, uh, <laughs> to the conditions that are afflicting you. Yeah, which again is why I really appreciate the interviews you do, the writing you do. Where I think it's unfortunate uh, so many of these things that have happened, and that again, I my financial career I guess is almost twenty years now. Um, and getting to the point where I've lost faith in all these institutions that here in the U.S. we were told are there to help and provide good information. Um, but again, that's why it's great having you on here and getting what we don't hear from the mainstream news. Um, and something I haven't heard, uh, well, actually, even some of the mainstream I've seen covered a little bit on CNBC lately, is that many say China is not going to sell their treasuries because obvious or most likely they would take a massive loss if they tried to unwind that position, which on one hand I agree with. On the other hand, if I lend someone who has a gambling issue X amount of money, he loses it, keeps coming back asking for more, there is some point at which you say, all right, this money's not coming back. I'm going to write off the loss now rather than making it bigger. So I'm wondering what your thoughts would be, especially, I would agree that maybe it's not their first choice, but, you know, if they keep getting backed into a corner with sanctions uh, and all the things escalating with the trade war, um, do you think that's something that they're thinking about now? Again, we hear how, well, if they sold all these treasuries, they'd take a loss, although Russia did just sell about $100 billion, so maybe a twelfth or so of what China has, and the market rallied while they were selling. So curious what your thought is on how they might respond to what's happening right now. Well, I think the way China has been responding and been doing so on more or less a stealth basis for a great many years China's been taking accumulated U.S. government debt and they've been pledging it as collateral for uh, things like infrastructure in Africa. Uh, they, they, they pledge the fiat debt for, for tangible, real things in the real world. And, you know, the day, the day that the debt stops paying its coupon or the day the debt uh, uh, goes to Zool, uh, China will just allow the uh, uh, bonds to be taken over by the people who have basically given China the, the real stuff. And ultimately, there will be a bag holder, but I don't believe the bag holder is going to be China. Uh, the bag holder will be the parties that China has pledged the bonds to for, for the real tangible things. Right. And the other issue is China has been feverishly buying physical precious metal mm -hmm. for a lot of years now. And anything that China loses on the fiat front, I think they'll make it back in spades on the appreciation of the physical precious metal. So you see China, China is, uh, you know, the Chinese invented fiat money. So I think the Chinese are more aware of all of its uh, shortcomings, maybe a little better than us white people who, who think we have uh, the world by the tail and think we know, uh, you know, how to, how to huckster uh, the next guy better than anyone else. The Chinese uh, have long history with money. They invented it. Speaking of China, I've actually been hearing in the last week or two some fascinating figures or guesses of how much gold they actually have. 
Uh, I believe the last I checked, they haven't really updated their figure for a couple of years. So I'm curious, do you have any ballpark of when you think about China and their gold holdings, whether it's something that can be directly verified or not, or if it's just a number that you think of in your head, um, how much gold do you think they actually have at this point? Uh, they're never going to admit their true holdings. Uh, but if I, if I was forced to make a guess, um, you know, like one of those guesses where you guess how many jelly beans are in a jar and the person who comes closest wins the jelly beans, uh, my guess would be that China would have 30,000 metric tons minimum, mm -hmm. and I could be very light, and I reckon Russia has more. Yes, which it's, it's fascinating you know, your answer there because uh, I'm not sure if you heard of a fellow named the London Paul who does uh, a bunch of interviews and some interesting analysis. And I was listening to his one of his podcasts about a week ago, and he was saying that he estimates Russia and China having about 40,000 ounces. And I was almost fell off my chair for a second. Okay. And That'd be 40,000 metric tons. Yeah, tons, tons. Yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> so again, I find him to be a pretty methodical and well-researched guy. And so it's interesting to hear that it's really that could be that much more than what we've been told. And uh, perhaps last question here. I've been waiting all week to get your thought on this one. Again, related to gold. You know, ever since 2011, where we saw these mysterious uh, plummets in the middle of the night, again, I would say that the trading shop I was working at, if I executed an order like they did on September 6th or 7th, 2011, that right after the Swiss <laughs> announced with what was then supposedly the last safe haven was going to peg to the euro, and I'm thinking, geez, is gold going to cross 2,000, and it plummets. Um, I've thought that was clearly manipulation in my impression. And so for the last seven years, I've been thinking similar perhaps to Enron, where you were, let's say you weren't one of the top guys who was rigging stuff, but just regular person paying attention. There were probably signs before everything went down. So that's one of the ways I've approached the gold and silver situation, thinking, all right, what might I see right before, you know, we see a big move or we see a reset or something like that. Um, so I'm curious your opinion, anything that you're looking for, you know, we heard the U.S. Mint run out of silver. I've talked with Andy Sheckman of Miles Franklin. He is seeing increased premiums. And about a week ago, Ted Butler mentioned in one of his columns that he has been hearing of delays in the 1,000-ounce bar market. Um, so certainly those got my attention. I'm curious, what do you think we might see before something finally happens? Well, I think things have been occurring, uh, and specifically things have been happening. Uh, much of the world is, is, is clearly preparing for a world uh, when the dollar is not the world's reserve currency. Um, and probably one of the biggest uh, sticking points for me might have been, I think it was now three weeks ago, when the German for, uh, uh, foreign minister said that it, it's, it's time we prepare uh, for, a, you know, for a post-dollar world. Yeah. I mean, you know, this, this is not Russia or China right. or Chavez in Venezuela or Castro in Cuba or Gaddafi in Libya talking about a world when the dollar is displaced or replaced. This is the German foreign minister. This is a NATO member. This is, uh, you know, supposedly one of America's staunchest allies. And they're opining about this very publicly now. So if that isn't writing on the wall, um, I would just recommend people to put their head back up their behind and carry on. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing how the signs are there. I did see that and found that rather stunning because like you point out, it's not some small country and we're starting to run out of trading <laughs> partners left here that aren't walking away. So with and that, all say, Chris, all I can say is if words are being bandied about in public like that, it means preparations are 
well underway yeah. behind the curtain. And, you know, which, which means that we could, we could see our world fundamentally change in a very significant way at any time on very short notice. I could not agree more. Uh, and, you know, I grew up pretty focused on using the analytical half of the brain. In recent years, I've learned to feel the intuition a bit more. And certainly, it feels as if something is coming soon. And um, so with that said, it's been great talking with you today. And perhaps if you could share where people can find you so they can stay ahead of the curve. I think your research is great and appreciate your interviews. Um, and also, I hear you have a new book out, which I was looking oh. for. If you can tell people and myself where I can get a copy of that. Listen, the, Chris, the book's been around since 2004, uh, so pre-financial crisis, and it actually never did go to print. I had three manuscripts created, uh, but I do uh, uh, send people the electronic version of the book uh, for free. So uh, the book's been uh, been around for a long time, and... Uh, yeah. Anyway, that's that. And you can catch me on the web at kirbyanalytics.com. Okay. And the email address, if people are looking to get a copy of that book, they can find there as well? Yep. Our Kirby at kirbyanalytics.com. Great. Well, I will be excited to read through that. I'm a little behind 2004, but I heard about it the other day. And again, I'm grateful for all you're doing and sharing some truth. I know that a lot of the folks who do this uh, do face some risk in speaking up. Um, so again, I'm really grateful for all you've done and it's been a pleasure to have you on the show and visit Kirby Analytics. And with that said, we'll wrap up today, but thanks again for coming on, Rob. It's been a pleasure to talk with you. Pleasure meeting you too.